Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of There's No Business Like. I'm Brian Zelmer from KU Presents, and I'm joined with my friends, Katie. Hey, Katie Miller with the Midland Center for the Arts in Midland, Michigan. Danielle. Hey, it's Danielle Van Hook from the Alden in McLean, Virginia. Kevin. Kevin Maynard from Quad City Arts. And Josh. Josh Benson, rocking from Marion, Illinois at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. So I interviewed Mark Wilson. And before we get into that conversation, I just wanted to say it made me think a lot about some of the teachers in my past. Um, and just wondering if you guys had any teachers or professors that really had a profound impact on on you. Yes, Brian, I've had a few in my life that I'm very appreciative of, but there's one that always comes to mind. And that was, uh, her name's Michelle Schneiden uh, from Geneseo High School. And Miss Schneiden was, well, I think she still is an English teacher there. And she was always incredibly supportive of the arts and just, you know, of performance in general. Because when I was in high school, that's what I was really passionate about. I mean, it's what I thought I was going to go to college for. But she found opportunities to like foster that and encourage that in the classroom, like specifically for me. And it's one of those things that I've never forgotten and have been very you know, I, I I felt seen, like I felt really appreciated by her. So that was really what led me to continue to do that and, and pursue that. Um, it really just the arts in general. I would say, Brian, oh gosh, I have so many as well. And I would love to call out um, all of them, but I would spe- especially like to shout out Dr. Wendy Scattergood, who was one of my political science professors um, at St. Norbert College during undergrad. And she's just a badass. Um, and she after my first semester of school picked me to be the department teaching assistant. So I started being a TA freshman year, um, identified that I had passion and talent and she pushed me really hard during undergrad um, and never let me take a step back, never cut me any slack. Even when I was like sick and asked for extensions on papers, she was like, no, can't do it. Um, But she also, I think really demonstrated for me what a full and multidimensional life could be outside of your passion. Not only did she teach and was on TV talking about political science stuff during elections and whatever, but she also played the cello in the Green Bay Orchestra, Symphony Orchestra, and had passions outside of her work as well. So I think a lot about how she chose to live her life and what a great example that was for me. And frankly, you know, my other students that were her students as well. Yeah, where to start? In high school, um, I had an incredible teacher named Carrie Schoberg, and her husband, Jim, um, directed some of the shows that we did. And they had such a passion for working with high schoolers and for creating theater. And they had a very strong vision of what it was they were going to create it. And when I was in Carrie's class, I always felt cared for and seen, like Kevin said, even though I think I was one of the youngest people in the class and my talent level was significantly lower. I, she never made me feel um, like I was, you know, really any different, was always like super encouraging. Um, but also I had somebody who taught me a lot. Um, and this is a, going back a little bit to the mentor conversation, but I do think that she was more of a teacher. Um, the executive director of the summer theater that I worked at, her name is Audrey Castricane, and she would just drive me in every day and we would talk about, um, picking shows and running the theater and just her life and how, how she kind of kept it all together. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that. So my experience in high school was kind of outside the box. I mean, I, I didn't go to some revolutionary high school that fostered uh, you know, your own track type of thing. But at the same time, it did because from the time I was a freshman in high school, I immediately found tech theater and lighting and scene design and scenery. And all of the teachers in the school recognized that. And so literally as I became a sophomore, junior and senior, anytime that there was study time or time to work on stuff in a class, I'd say 60% of the teachers said, Josh, if you need to go and do something in the theater, you can go ahead and do that. They fostered and let me shift my focus all through. And it was such a collective effort with them giving me the freedom to explore something I was passionate about when there was no education within that high school in that avenue that really was phenomenal to the point that like there was a, there was a, an after school club that had like a suicide awareness and they, they had 
a band come in and and I did the lighting for that band every year because they saw that that's where my focus was and they let me focus on that and do that and I wasn't even in the club but they brought me along for all the things because I was part of it and the dean of students at the school was also the basketball coach and he had a big like basketball tournament every year and he's like Josh you do, you do cool lighting stuff do you want to do like a Chicago Bulls type of intro for it every year and so they totally like they put me up on a scaffolding and I hung lights from the rafters in the in the basketball gymnasium and created a light show every year and so it was this big collective effort of the sc- from the the school as a whole supporting me in what I had found that had nothing to do with any path educationally within that school but supporting something that they found that I was passionate about and and I can't be more grateful for that that's really awesome i loved hearing all of your stories and like most of you, I, I can't pick just one teacher because I'd feel like I'm leaving out some important people because there have been so many impactful teachers in my life. But I, I actually want to acknowledge um, a guidance counselor I had because I, I had moved schools in halfway through eighth grade and I was pretty lost and had a really difficult time. And in ninth grade, I was meeting with my, um, early in the ninth grade, I was meeting with my guidance counselor and she said, have you ever sung? And I said, oh, I used to sing in sixth grade, but then my voice changed and they said I wasn't good enough anymore. And, um, and so I, you know, wasn't doing anything like that. And she said, no, I can hear it in your voice. She just heard something in my voice and, and walked me right then and there to the chorus room to meet Miss Wetmore. And that changed my life because that led me to the, all the choral stuff I did and, and then that introduced me to the drama kids and the drama teacher, Miss Carter, and, you know, on and on and on. And I think that set the path for where I am today, that one meeting with my guidance counselor saying, hey, have you ever sung? I bring that up because, again, speaking with Mark Wilson, who uh, I have a conversation with in this week's interview, he was once a teacher and impacted a lot of lives. And on top of a bazillion other things that he's he's done, he's really an amazing arts administrator and leader and just inspirational in so many ways, And as you'll hear in a moment. So I hope you enjoy this, and we'll talk to you on the other side. Hi, I'm Mark Wilson, Executive Director of Zona Art Center at Lehigh University. Mark, it's great to sit down with you. Thanks for joining our podcast. Thanks for having me. Can you explain what an executive director essentially is in a general sense? My role is to do both the administrative and artistic planning for the art center itself. So I have a team of 21 full-time folks and some part-time workers and some volunteers and we do our presenting series, but also what is unique here is that we're also the home, uh, the building itself is the home of the music and theater department. So my team also works with those two departments and we're also housed the uh, Lehigh University Art Galleries and we also help with those things too. So we do a lot of uh, rental events for other c- campus groups that wanna use our facilities. We also uh, do rental events for people who are outside of our campus. We present our own things itself. We also do some co-productions with some folks, and we do some things across the community and also across the campus that's outside of our building. Wow. I want to learn a lot more about all of that um, in in just a moment. But first, I think it would be helpful if the the folks had a little bit of your background and how you even entered this field to begin with. Um, Can you maybe just give us a highlighted version of your, your journey here? Sure. So I would tell folks that my journey to arts administration was just unusual. Um, it wasn't something I ever thought or dreamed of actually ever doing. I never saw someone of color in my role, so it wasn't anything that I ever even thought of because I didn't see anyone that looked like me in the role. Um, I have my undergrad degree in music education, my grad degree in opera performance. I was a opera performer for a while, and then I was a in. I was in business for a little bit of time, so I worked at a couple of major retailers, and my last big business position was as a regional director of loss prevention, uh, where I learned a lot about retail and um, brand awareness, so I took those things with me. And then I um, ended up leaving that position, and I started to teach at an all-black school as a part-time choir teacher and music teacher along with teaching as adjunct at a few different community colleges. And then um, there was, I was doing that for about five or six years and I was driving from South Jersey to South 
New York in one day to do you know two different jobs. That's kind of how my my days were were at that time when I was actually enjoying the fact that I was back in music and not really doing the business part. And then I, I saw an opening at a at a college down in um, Ocean County and. The woman who was the vice president for academic affairs happened to be the dean at one of the schools where I was the adjunct from before, and she remembered me. I, be- I got hired as a full-time music teacher, and then after a few months, she said, you're a great teacher, but you're an administrator. She's like, I know it, because you don't think like a teacher. You actually think really big. And so she said, I think you should be helping us with this, um, with the art center they had at the school. And so I was teaching and working at the art center, so I was doing both jobs became too much. And then they said, let's actually have you just do this and focus your time on that. That's a lot to unpack there. But if, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back even further and find out what it was that sparked your interest in music. It, was it the opera? Was it just music in general? What, what led you to decide to take that path as, as a child? Yeah, I always enjoyed singing. Um, and then when my voice changed in elementary school, I stopped singing because they said, you, you sing too low. And it wasn't until I went to um, middle school that one of the teachers there at the school, she was a great advocate for me, and she is the one that started to get me back into uh, singing. And then that's something I started to pick back up on. And then throughout high school, I started to do some musicals and choral stuff. And then I started to go to some summer camps at Simpson College. And then while there, they kind of recruited me to come to school there as a music uh, education person. Was there a certain genre or style of music that you kind of felt more connected to as you were learning all these different styles? When I was in high school, it was musical theater that I really enjoyed. And in college, you know, classical music really felt really good on my voice. So it was more about how it felt producing it than it was necessarily listening to, or, or was it a little of both? Yeah, a little of both. I actually uh, remember when I went to the Des Moines Metro Opera and I saw uh, La Boheme, I said, that's kind of cool. I, I can do that. It was more like, I can sing like those guys. <laughs> um, I enjoyed the storytelling of, of musicals, um, but there weren't a lot of folks of color in musicals. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it was one of those things. Well, I was wondering I, about that with opera too. It, that's true too. Yeah, it's, it, it's starting to change colorblind. Is you know starting to happen more and some places like I sang in Germany for a little bit of time. They did a lot of colorblind casting in Germany for some time. That's where a lot of African American performers went there for a while. And then when I do oratorios, it's basically concert version of singing. So therefore, they don't care. It's all about the voice. So those are things that I really did enjoy. Cool. Let's bring it back to to present day. So. Before you came here, you mentioned you were at, well, actually, Ocean. no, you were at Ocean. Was that the Ocean one Ocean County College, yep. Oh, okay. So how how was your administrative role there different than what it is here? Because I, I know I've bounced around in, in different administrative roles, and from venue to venue, there's nuanced differences or sometimes major differences. Can you just maybe help us understand how it's not just a cookie-cutter position no matter where you go? Yeah, the community college place is um, multiple hats. That's what I would tell folks. And when I started in the position, it morphed in my seven years when I was there, where I started as the artistic director. Basically, I was just helping them with the planning and bringing in some artistic talents. It ended with me being the executive director of programming and partnerships was how my role ended. And I was in charge of the Grunin Center, in charge of the Novins Planetarium, in charge of the Blavelt Lecture Series, in charge of summer camps. I was the liaison to the Grunin Performing Arts High School, and I was the person who helped connect Ocean County College to other four-year universities with their arts programming to bring those four-year programs down to Ocean County College, hence the name Partnerships. So I had a lot of multiple hats there. Wow. I myself am a university presenter, and there's really, within presenters, there's a lot of different types, and university presenters, one type. And it's very interesting when you're talking about how you had to do, like, the planetarium and some of these other roles that people maybe wouldn't intuit, you know, that they go together. Yeah, and I think that's the one thing that's, helpful in my life of not having the um, perfect path of arts administration where I worked in business. I was a performer. I was a teacher. Therefore, you know, you might hear people say about a growth mindset, also having the creativity to understand in yourself to find the answers. So all these things, I did not have the answers to them, but I knew how to find the answers 
or how to solve the problems. I didn't know anything about a planetarium, but what I did know is actually how to motivate people and how to listen to people of what their concerns were. So when the planetarium team said, this is what we want to do, basically it was my job to help make what they wanted to happen, happen. And so that's what I was able to do, bring in more funders for them, help them think more creatively for their programming, and actually bring them in places that they didn't even know that they can do. And we worked together to really connect the art center and the planetarium through our programming together, where we actually created like a summer camp with this person who was an astrophysicist. And we created a summer camp, which was a, um, a space camp for kids who wanted to get into engineering and um, rocket science. And so we had Janet Ivy here for a week. And so she did her performance on our stage and she did her space camp inside the planetarium's dome. And then the rest of the kids met on our campus for a whole week. So it was a great way for us That's to fantastic. connect those yeah. two things together. Now I want to go back to your teaching a little bit and then, then get into present, present, present day, learning about the connections you made with students. Um, were there any surprises going into that, you know, your, your mindset going into that, thinking it was going to be one thing, but then you, you learned by working with the students it was something else, or did it just go the way you planned? Well, my first job was actually as a middle school um, music teacher, so if anyone knows anything about middle schools, whatever you plan is not going to go the way <laughs> you think it should. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. I learned a lot for myself from that experience, and a lot of my time teaching in community college, the one thing I, I, that helped me there, which I, I still bring in here now, is that for community college, it means it's open for everyone and anyone. So you can have a wide range of students. You have adult learners. You have folks who are coming back from a career. You have people who are, you know, had been going to maybe a four-year school. They failed. They wanted to come to community college or folks who were working after high school and went back to school. So you have a wide range of folks in the classes that I was teaching. And so I had to actually figure out ways to get those folks on the same page. And part of that was actually having the students listen to each other, reflect back, and we actually had a lot of conversations. And that's the same thing when it comes to running a staff or being in the staff. You have to learn how to work in a team, people who have different backgrounds, um, different ages, uh, sexuality, cultural backgrounds, how to listen to each other, how to understand some cultural cues where a word you might use in your culture might be totally different than what they're saying. So then you get to say, wait a minute, is what you're saying is the meaning that I think it is? And that's what I did with my students. That I said, I think you mean this word this way, and I think you mean it this way. What do you all say? Have a conversation. And then they actually started to talk to each other. And it actually helped me be a better teacher because then I always had to make sure that what I was telling my students, that they all understood the word, what I was saying, connected to all of them because I can see on someone's face that word means one thing, and someone else says this word means another, and then that's where we actually started to actually ground ourselves. That's so fascinating because in this industry, in any role, but particularly in the role that we're in, I think all of those types of experiences are great ones to, to pack into your suitcase of tools to bring with you because you can use them in your current role. Um, so let's get up to your current role here. You're in now a private institution, so I'm just curious what the differences are. That That's what I'm really trying to get at between the two different kinds of presenting institutions, even though they're both university presenters. You have to get people to trust what you're saying no matter what. So whether you have a lot of uh, red tape or a little bit of red tape, you should assume, I always assume everything from the sense of people might not understand, so take the red tape in that sense. So yes, I have less red tape here, but what I have done is not just say, okay, I'm just going to do what I want in a vacuum and not actually speak to people, but we actually proactively communicate way in advance. So we actually speak with like our risk management team. Most other folks here on our campus that do programming have to go through them, have to go through our legal department. But because of us being a university presenter doing this for a while, they trust what we're going to do. But I also tell them, that's fine. I'm still going to reach out to you and, and let you know some things that we're doing really proactively ahead of time. So there are those things. We report into the dean's office of the College of Arts and Science. So we do work with that team also. So those are the things that we do. So there's a lot less uh, things of what they call it running up the pole that we have to do. But I also like to really think about uh, the trust you want to build. And so the more you're actually able to share things with folks early on, 
then that gives you that latitude to make those decisions that you need to. I got to work with the development department. They have their rules and regulations, working with like our, our budgeting office, working with the people who do office sponsored research for grants and the, the development folks. They all have their certain ways of doing things. Some of it does not work at all for us. It really works for like scientists and other things. And so I thought I could explain to them that this is really does not work. Um, and part of that is me to being clear and and having a story usually to tell them. What my team here have seen me do is that we had a lot more red tape when I first started here and we have a lot less now. And part of that is because I would do it the way that the people wanted to do it. And then when it didn't work and I tried my best, I would then take that story and I would show them why it was actually ineffective. And I say, here are some solutions and actually to make it work. And I gave them a choice of actually how to fix it. So the one thing is not to say that's a problem and not come with a solution, but to come up with some solutions and not just have one solution because that might be your bias. Come up with a range of solutions and then say, this is what I choose. I think we best for us, but here are some solutions and what are your thoughts are. And that to me is that what actually helps. And then you gain that trust from folks too. That's really smart. So obviously, you know, you're kind of dancing around the word collaborations. You said partnerships before. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about the important collaborations you have throughout your different your umbrella of different roles and, and things you oversee? Well, there's um, programming partnerships. So that's a different one. But we want to talk about the mechanics of the administrative side of those kind of collaborations, partnerships. It really is getting into the room and talking with folks and explaining to them what you do because folks on campus just don't understand. And so what I tr try to do and what I explain to my team is you have to explain it well enough so that when someone else that you're talking to is in the room, they can explain it for other folks too. So they become your allies. And so I have found those folks in the controller's office, in the treasurer's office, in development, um, in uh, office of sponsored research, um, in the dean's office. And I say, these are the things. And I talk to them constantly about what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. And when I do that, I tell my folks, just don't stay at once. We should not make the assumption that someone understands at one time. I said, how many times have someone said something to you and you actually got it the right first time? I say the same thing over and over. And I say the same thing to so my team. is like, man, I was like, yeah, you say the same thing. Not try to change your story. Say the same thing. If it's important to you, say it again. And then all of a sudden, they know what it is. And then, therefore, it becomes ingrained into them. And whenever you meet with them, they go, yeah. And they, they'll say it off their lips because they heard it so many times to them. So each of my per partners, they might all have hear something different. But then collectively together, that full pie, what we have they all have that story together. Now, marketing is always an important thing in, in what we do. And a lot of times in colleges and universities, they'll have their own marketing department or or a person that's in charge of advertising and things. But they often will focus, obviously, on the the school side of things, getting students and, and you know, more tuition in and so forth. And so sometimes it's hard for organizations within the university like us to, to get the full attention we need in that department. Do you utilize university marketing department or do you have that a, a role under you directly or do you use an outside agency? How does marketing work for, for your organization? So when I got here, we had a one woman team. And so I explained to her that sh she was understaffed and that I will figure it out. And so now she is a director of marketing and communications. So her, she has a title change. And she has a marketing assistant that works with her. So we have a two-woman team now in our marketing department here. That's on your staff. That's on our staff that reports to me. And we also have a uh, freelance graphic designer that we, we bring in uh, from a local community college. We're sitting in your office today, and, and you've got marketing stuff all over your table that looks wonderful. Very uh, eye-catching and whatnot. But I, last time I was here, you told me and showed me a really cool, uh, fully, totally in Spanish uh, brochure. And you told me a really interesting story about a group that helped you with that. Do you mind sharing that? Sure. It's, um, one of the things that I, when I came here, we are in the south side of Bethlehem. That's where we are located. And we have a very large uh, Puerto Rican population here. So one of the things that I started to identify and taking this role two years ago, and I started asking the questions of, are our doors open to the community where we reside since we are we should be the connector from the universe from the university to the community and when I looked at my staff there was no one on my staff that is bilingual or anyone that's actually Puerto Rican 
Um, we have no volunteers in the, our ushers that were there either. So I made it a part of what I wanted to do is uh, figure out how do we actually um, both bring in some folks, but also understanding that also as a person of color, you want to bring someone in where you actually have your staff be able to embrace different cultures itself. And so that's part of a, a whole brain approach that we've been taking. And then when we looked at our marketing aspect too, we were not actually marketing to anyone also in that area too. So we uh, talked about creating a full Spanish language brochure. We have a um, children's brochure that's also Spanish language with the Lehigh Valley um, Children's Hospital, they are a sponsor for that. They were very excited about us having a Spanish language brochure. And we're working on having a Spanish language um, website in the future also. And one of the things we did was we reached out to a person who is a, a playwright in New York. And this is one of the things that she does. She actually helps with translating um, what you have from a brochure into a language that will work for a, a many different Spanish-speaking cultures. And so we were able to have her translate that, and we shared it with some of our Spanish-speaking colleagues here in the university, and they were like, well, this is perfect. It is wonderful. And they all enjoyed the, the actually having the opportunity to be a part of that discussion with us. And so we're able to now get that out. We've been working with the Hispanic Center here of uh, Bethlehem, and part of what we were doing with them we were even busting them to some of our children's shows. We brought in Pablo uh, Villegas to come here and perform some Spanish guitar music. And we had them come here during one of our, uh, our school performances, and they enjoyed it. And we now have partnered with them to bring them to lots of different kind of performances. And they are, uh, a lot of folks are older, elderly folks. And so we actually will pay for a bus to get them here um, because we think it's important to actually really do good in our neighborhood. And we're not just bringing them to Spanish language things too. They're coming here for the New York Philharmonic. We said, this will be a world-class orchestra. You should come here too. And so that's what I think as a university presenter, we should do. We should actually market to folks. If you want the folks there, you should actually have your marketing materials reflect the community of people that you want to bring in. And you should actually do the good work. And the community's responding, as you mentioned. Before you got here, that wasn't necessarily the case, that the those members of the community, were they coming? There were a couple of shows that we have done before to bring people. But it's always a challenge. You bring something in, but you don't have, it's not sustainable. If you're going to do something, really think about it as a plan. Don't just do it one time and inconsistently. And the part I would say is that it's about also... Um, less paternal instinct of like, I'm going to do what's good for you, but actually having the community in the conversation with you and actually help having them help you develop the programming also. That's what you can do. Um, but so you, there's some things you have to do. Like we have to get our marketing materials where they can go, oh, wow. So it's not like us. We're not going to have the marketing materials for one year, right? That's the problem. Imagine if we had them, the Spanish marketing materials for one year and we got like two people to come. Now, some some of might say, okay, my return on investment was nothing, so you know what? Damn it, we're not going to do it anymore. But that's a really a really bad approach because that's what folks who are marginalized, people who have been left to the side, always think you're going to do. They're waiting for you to give up. But actually, when you take the time and develop those things over time, that's what you got to do. You got to think long term, and long term is not one or two years. I'm talking about 10, 15, 20 years of time of doing the right work. We have a lot of colleagues, too. They'll talk about how they want to be able to invite the whole community. And they'll have, like you were saying, you have a, a large Latino or Hispanic community that aren't coming. They'll, they'll say, oh, well, I, I booked this one show. You know, and they think that just booking a show that fits that genre uh, is going to do the work. But that's not that's not what it's about. It's about how, developing a relationship. And it's not just, oh, I'm going to book this one, um, y you know, show of of African-American performers and think that people of color are just going to come now because I have that. It's, it's more than that. It's more than just booking a show. Yeah. That, and I think that's the challenge for folks who are in a predominantly white institution and from a, of a staffing that's predominantly white, the bias is you are going to look at life through your lens. So therefore that is how you're, you, it's all going to be um, seen. And so 
if you want to really be engaged with the community, it's not that. Just ask yourself the question, do you feel connected to someone if you never really talked to them? <laughs> and no. And so how can a community feel connected to you if, if you're really not talking with them? It has to be a conversation. A conversation happens back and forth. If it's one way, it's, it's a lecture or lecturing or condescending. And that is the issue. And I think if people take a step back, if you're programming without talking to someone, then it's a lecture. It's you telling them what you think. But a conversation happens back and forth where you might be going out into the community, having a community come in, have them be a part of an advisory group, have them be a part of a conversation, really having a chance to listen to what is being said. Um, it's not just about throwing something on the stage, throwing in some marketing materials, throwing some dollars, and then saying, oh, it never came, I'm done. It has to, it has to be more than that itself. It has to be um, having people feel that they are welcomed, that they belong itself. Thank you for that. Um, I want to get to finance because you you are a rock star, whether you realize it or not. People talk about how amazing you are at obtaining some large donations. Do you have a certain approach? Do you tailor it by the each individual that or organization that you're going to? Can you just kind of help the people that may be entering the field know some basic ways to go about fundraising with corporations, you know, large sponsors, however, you know, donors? In case those who can't see me, I am a African American man, bald headed. I'm six foot. <laughs> I'm wearing a blue sweater right now. And for me, um, I said to myself, the biggest challenge is for folks who are white to trust someone that they don't have seen in their life to give them money. That is a challenge. And I think for a lot of executive directors who are of color, that is a challenge because the, the space, whether from universities or nonprofits, are dominated by white men. And so and a lot of donors are going to be white men also. But also, there are also the, the white women who actually give funding also. Um, and the audience that we have is mostly going to be women who are coming to shows. So we have to understand who are the folks who are going to be uh, donating itself to. Therefore, I understand that I, there's probably more things that I have to do compared to other folks. So therefore, I probably am very hard on myself when it comes to the fundraising aspect and the donations because I understand that there is that challenge um, that folks might not have seen someone like myself. So my background before, as I said, was as, an, as a loss prevention person. And so having a chance to speak to people a lot was very helpful, actually understanding. The one thing I would just tell folks is this, be true to what you do. Right. So understand what is it? What's your mission? What are your goals? Don't try to shape your ass to what the person is. It might not match right then and there. And that is probably the most important thing. I try to find something that will be a mutually beneficial for both our organization and another organization or person. And to find that one thing, not to say that someone says, I want to give money towards, um, I don't know, blood drives. And we're like an arts organization. We go, okay, we're going to have a blood drive and have a show. That's like dumb. Like that, that, that then someone might do that because they want to get like the $10,000. I'm like, to me, that's like, okay, that's that. We're not going to do that. But you know what? I'm going to connect you to our college of health. And that's one of the things I learned to do in the very beginning. I would say to someone, that's great, but that actually does not connect to what we're going to do. And I think here's a better person. And people really appreciate that in the very beginning. And when people said, what, and when folks said, man, you didn't like try to make it. I'm like, no, it doesn't make sense. Like I cannot, my brain cannot function through like making something up. So that's the one thing I would tell folks, like really understand what is it that you're doing. And when you do that over and over and over, it becomes part of who you are. So then when you start speaking to donors, they actually trust you. And they say, you know what? That's great. You know, I want to connect you with this person because this that program you're talking about might better connect with this person. And they do the same thing because you're helping them and now they're going to help you. And when it comes to individual donors, um, I'm an introverted person. I can talk to folks one-on-one and having conversations, understanding folks, talking about the passion is important. So the things I try to do is a couple things. I like storytelling. I also like data. So what you want to do is understand the person who you're talking to. What do they want? Because sometimes if you're a storyteller and this person's like all about data, then there's a disconnect. If you are uh, telling someone 
uh, um, some data stuff and they love hearing a story, there's a disconnect. So what you got to understand is when you're doing those things, look at the person, see what what their interests are through the conversations you have with them, and you're going to know. And so for me, I see a lot of folks, they they love the passion. So that's one thing. It's like they love the passion, whether it's passion through like the qualitative stuff we're going to do or the quantitative stuff we're going to do. They like that. They like, oh, or it's through the storytelling saying like, this is what's going to happen. Let me tell you a story of like when we did this program, this person, Billy, and this is what happened with Billy. And because of Billy, this is other things that happened. And they love to get into that story. And then I asked them, I see you as part of that journey now in that story. And that's the part they go, wow, I want to be a part of it. Or it's like, look at all the impact we've done. Look at all this quality work we've done. I want you to be a part of that. And that's the reason why we're talking with you now. And that's where they, 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 they hear that passion. They understand that in order to get to the next level, it's through them. It's like, we're going to still do this no matter what. And that's what I would say. It's like, we're doing this no matter what. Like our Spanish brochure, we're doing this no matter what. If I don't have the money, it's fine. I'm doing it no matter what. But guess what? With your help and your funding, I can make my Spanish brochure that we're doing right now for this. I can then do billboards. I can do this and imagine what else more we can do. And someone says, yeah, I want to I want to help you get to that next level. It's like, great, because they know that there's a baseline of what we're going to do no matter what. But I want to get to the next level. And I explain to me, this is what the next level is. Either here's a story of what's going to help us with that next level or here's the data that's going to help us get to that next level because we know. That is an incredible a uh, way of approaching it. And I think I think a lot more of us need to hear it, even us experienced quote unquote people. So thank you for sharing that. I can't not ask about programming, your programming approach, your curatorial approach, uh, if you will. Um, can you maybe just share about how you go about planning a season, even if you have people under you helping you program, I'm sure you give them direction and, and kind of set that that model for, for how you want to work. Yeah. So one of the, the challenges uh, coming here compared to where I was before I had a lot more time in the space where I was before. That's a curse and a blessing also because we would program 100 events on our own, which gave us a lot of room to make some errors, if, if, you, can, if you can think of it that way also, financial errors to help us make some things work. Um, here, the window is a lot smaller. So like I said about storytelling and data, um, we have 2% of the time in our three spaces. So I have 2% of time that I can program. Can you just if you, explain why that so if is? You take, if you take the 365 days and you take my Baker Hall, my Black Box, and my um, Diamond Theater, we actually only have room to program for 2% of the time. And the reason why is that we have classes in some of our spaces. We have the music and theater department have, have things in there. We have other events across campus that are, that are utilizing our spaces. And so therefore, we don't have much uh, space to be in that building. So one of the things that I, I thought about when we um, had that challenge is how, what can I do to then enlarge the footprint of our programming, understanding the restrictions that we have. So we started to program outdoors. We started to go across our campus. We started to go into the community and we started to utilize the Packer Chapel. So I just want to make sure that that can be a part of what you can hear as uh, some changes that we've done. And that is also part of the programming. <clears throat> so for the Packer Chapel, we started to bring in some nice chamber music in there and we're expanding and we're the goal is within like another couple of years to have a chamber series inside the, the Packer Chapel. We're building that audience. Um, it was really great to bring in the Westminster Bell Choir. Um, we're bringing in the Canadian Brass to help us build that uh, audience also. But that's a space that we want to start to bring, a, like I said, more chamber music itself. Um, but my approach to the artistic planning really is what that 2% understanding that as a, as a limitation is. Um, and also the fact that our budget is not fully funded from the university. We have to find that balance between um, programming that is artistic quality. That's really going to press the bounds. Um, I would say agitate folks or bring people to, together through some thoughts, bring the campus and the community together through some questioning and so that with things that we know is going to make money. So that's the balancing that we have to do. So with that in mind, I've been really, that's the part we talked about earlier about donors that said, look, this is my limitations, but with your funding, we're going to be able to do more of the things that really can help the community because we are a university presenter. 
damn it. <laughs> We're not here to bring in a, you know, all tribute bands and just try to make money, I said. Um, so that's what makes us different, that we can uh, push the bounds, have people think about things too, um, have us be a part of the conversation with some cultural questions. So that's kind of what I've been doing when it comes to like my artistic planning is like there are some things I'm going to do that's going to make some money. I try to uh, have that as as for sure. And then some things that we're going to do is really have those conversations. And a couple of pieces I want to share that I'm really excited about because um, this really is pressing the bounds is we're bringing in this, this uh, installation later on called Traveling While Black. It's a virtual reality installation. It's a replica of Ben Shilly Bowl, and people, when they sit down, like they're at a cafe, they put on the Oculus, and they're in a virtual reality movie, and it's 20 minutes long. And we're just excited about this because we're going to be able to have some community-wide conversations about what it means to travel uh, physically and metaphorically as a person of color. Um, with that installation, we are working with one of our professors here who's doing research on how can you use virtual reality to help people be more empathetic. We're also connecting with a lot of different um, organizations across the Lehigh Valley. So we're having one conversation called Travel While Black and Queer, Travel While Black Up the Corporate Ladder, Travel While Black Through Education, Travel While Black Co-Pods and Co-Conspirators. So these are all conversations that are happening outside of our space, but with other nonprofit leaders. And so it's a way for us to have the installation be the grounding place, but then the conversations be across the valley. So that's why I said as a university presenter, we can be a, a place to have conversations and also connect people together. So we're connecting people across Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton through these conversations. Um, and as a university presenter, we're also connecting this installation with two other folks here in Pennsylvania. So we're connecting it with um, Shippensburg University and Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. So together, um, we were able to connect with them to have this installation in Pennsylvania for nine months and have uh, statewide conversations on Travel While Black. That's fantastic. So, and then the other one program I thought is important to understand the artistic programming is I'm bringing this person in. Her name is Wu Fei, and she created a piece about the Holocaust called Hello Gold Mountain. And the important part for me is that she is performing this with the guzhen. It's a zither instrument from China. And she originally wrote it for 12 professional players. But when we had conversations with the, the uh, Lehigh University Philharmonic conductor and Wu Fei, they agreed to actually have the Lehigh Philharmonic actually accompany her. And so she's rewriting it for a larger scale orchestra to accompany her. So now our students are going to have an opportunity to perform a piece with a professional. And to me, that is actually what makes a university presenter so special, where we can connect a professional with our academic programs. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Mark, I have a time machine, and I just want to quickly bring you back for a minute to when you were doing that dual role and you were just starting to do administrative work. And... Um, I'm just curious if you have any advice for that young Mark or even just some words of encouragement that maybe he needed to hear at that time. Well, uh, I guess it's uh, you made the right choice. It's always good to take some chances. It was a hard decision leaving a place where I was secure teaching to go into something I didn't know anything about. For anyone that's a young administrator, you might be comfortable to say doing marketing. And then all of a sudden there is an opening for something else. And the question you say to yourself, but I'm a marketer, but ask yourself the question, can you program? Maybe you can, or maybe you're a programmer and you say, and there's another opening. There might be a way for you to actually find the passion, what you're doing and bring that into something and then learn quickly. I think you can. And that's the part for myself was that, it wasn't that until later on that I realized that the things I did in my past actually prepared me for what I did. I did not know that being in college, my college experience helped me with fundraising. When I was a uh, senior in college, I was the uh, vice president of my fraternity house. I was the vice president of external affairs. And my job at the time was to um, do a teeter-totter thon during homecoming where we would teeter-totter, for those who understand, it's like a seesaw, I don't know, part of the country, seesaw, teeter-totter. So we had a, a giant, like, 12-foot-long wooden plank on a gasoline barrel, and we went up and down for 48 hours. 
And my fraternity also invite another sorority house, and that's what we do. And we've done that over and over and over, and it was the same thing we've done for like 50 plus years. But darn it, they got a person like me, some dude who's an <laughs> artist who can think differently. And I said to, to the team, 48 hours is fine. What we've done is fine. But I said, how about we think creatively? Let's do 92 and 92. <laughs> Everyone's like, what does that mean? That means that we're going to teeter-totter for 92 hours straight in 1992. <laughs> and everyone's like, you are crazy. They're like, it's hard enough to try to get us to do it for two days. You want us to do it for 92 hours? When I brought this to my attention on my fraternity house, they were all upset. They were yelling and screaming. And then uh, my, my executive team already knew what I was going to say. I said, let me get the steam out. Let me be upset. And when they were all said and done, they were yelling. I, I, I said to them, I said, brothers, brothers, do you know that Brother Steve's girlfriend is dying right now from cystic fibrosis. Mm. It got quiet. I said, we're going to raise money for cystic fibrosis. Wow. It might not help her. She's in the hospital right now, but it's going to help someone. And so I said, we got her sorority house that's, that agreed to join us. We got another sorority house that agreed to join us. I got KOIA Radio to join, to be uh, doing some live feeds with us at our space. We're going to be on this show on TV, Teeter Tottering. We got this mall is going to be doing it with us too. We had all these people who actually added, who, who became sponsors because when I called them up. I said, hi, my name is Mark Wilson and my fraternity brother's girlfriend is dying from cystic fibrosis. Would you like to help us out? That was my quick elevator pitch. Wow. And they couldn't hang up on me. Mm -hmm. And they said, what do you, they said, tell us more. I said, we're going to teeter totter 92 and 92. And they said, that's great. And when the radio station, the KOA Golden Oldies, because I said, you know what? Folks who are older, they're the ones who give money. They said, we'll do a live remote while you guys are teeter tottering. And when I got them hooked, they started calling some of their sponsors and we got more sponsors. It was actually the most money we ever raised at a fundraiser was that. And I didn't actually know this until later on when I went back and I looked at the, the thing from my fraternity house. They're still raising money for cystic fibrosis. Nice. So you never know, nice. right? So therefore, I did not know that I was going to learn event planning, fundraising, sponsorships, all that um, from being in a fraternity house. I just knew then I learned quickly, have a quick little elevator speech. I understand how to get folks to come on board, how to bring people together, how to think logistically, how to you know, get people who are smart and things to help you solve the things. It wasn't just me. It was my whole team of folks that did it. But they were so excited about doing it. They said, yeah, we're going to get the list out. We're going to get more people to help us out. We we're going to get the administration to know what we're doing. And because of that, also the marketing angle, I didn't know I was an, I mean, I wouldn't call myself a marketer, but I know it was a marketer, but I said 92 and 92. And so those are all the things that really happened when I was a senior in college. And I guess that held on to the, those things, right? And so, I, so that's why it's so important to, when you're younger, take those risks, take the chances, do those things, because you get better at them, and then they help you in the future. Fantastic. Mark, I think we're going to need a part two with you, because you you're just a <laughs> fountain of knowledge, and there's so many things we didn't even get to that I was on my list to ask you. But Mark, thanks for taking the time to sit with me today, and I've really enjoyed hearing the stories, and, and I think you've really brought a lot of wonderful nuggets for, for our next generation to, to learn from. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Hey, so I just wanted to bring us back in here with something that we've talked about a few times, but we, I feel like we can't just leave it alone. At the top of his interview, Mark said that one of the reasons he didn't see himself as an arts administrator is because he didn't see somebody in that role as a person of color. And, you know, us um, as a group of five white people, that's something that we're never going to truly understand. I think it's so important to lift up voices like Mark so that more people coming up in the industry now can see him and the many other people that are now running um, organizations who are people of color and um, hope that that creates more space so that it's not such a homogenous group five, 10, 15 years from now. Yeah, and sort of take the inspiration from him and as what he's doing in his program there, because not only like, is he being a person that is, you know, uh, being representative of of his population? But like he went into that community and said, there's not anybody in our organization that represents our community and sort of was like, hey, let's bring them in. Let's do that. And let's not only do that on the surface level, but like, let's talk about consistency and let's talk about that. This isn't just two years in the making that sometimes that takes 10 or 15 years to build that relationship. And 
Furthermore, what I really loved about that was him equating that to a conversation because I'd never heard that before. And it really summed up that, 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 that in its entirety about how that it is a conversation that if it is just one person talking or one organization deciding what something's going to be, that it's no longer a conversation, that that's a lecture. And I was like, I loved that analogy there. Mm, me too. Well, and he used the term paternalistic, uh, which... <laughs> <laughs> oh, like that really caught me. And how many times do we ascribe or prescribe as institutions what our communities, quote unquote, need or quote unquote, want instead of being in true communication and conversation with them, like you just said, Kevin, the idea that engagement with in particular marginalized communities, but any community that is kind of outside of your current audience base takes years to build those relationships take years. It's not a one and done. It's not like he said, just bringing in one show and expecting people to show up and then can show up consistently. I think especially in this moment it is coming out of the pandemic. And as we rebuild, remembering that, because if it doesn't work the first time around, you have to have that commitment to that mission, that, co that commitment to that audience building. And when it doesn't work the first time around, like it can't be like, oh, financially, that was a that was a dud. Can't do it anymore because we have all these other things to do. No, like to rebuild our audiences coming out of the pandemic, that's going to be a key part to what we do. And it isn't going to just take one year. It's going to take five, 10, 15, like he said. And that's a, that was one of my favorite parts coming out of that conversation. And it, it spoke to me as someone who's starting to, uh, in, in my role, attempt to change the way that we're programming to program towards more audiences in our area because we've been failing in in the Marion Cultural and Civic Center, I, I've been at the head of it for 16 years. So it lays solely on my shoulders in, I have been failing at doing that because of my approach to it for years, because I was prescribing what I thought that community would want without having a conversation. And so hearing him talk about it in having a commitment, a long-term commitment to where once you do start programming with and for that community, the emphasis on with it's not going to fill the first time because you have not been inviting them to the table for so long that you've created a pattern and an expectancy of not being invited to the table and not programming for other communities. And in turn, it's going to take a long time to develop that and to change the perception of the organization to where it's understood that it's really for everyone. And that they're that it's clear that there are efforts being made for it to be for everyone. Josh, I'm like you. When I started out, you know, that was how I was trained. That oh, you're curating the the season, and I would turn to my you know cohorts who had been in it longer, and they would say the same thing. I would ask how they approached programming and how they picked things, and they said, you know, they programmed, you know, like a curator, and um, to them that meant that they selected what they think the was important to bring to the community. One thing that I love that Mark mentioned in this was what Kevin brought up too, is that um, struck home to me and I hadn't thought about it was that, you know, marginalized communities are waiting for you to give up and that it's a long-term game and really developing a relationship. Like we've been saying about everything, you know, everything is a relationship in this business. Yeah. Recently at a, at a board meeting that was actually brought up here at Quad City Arts is that, you know, most, most DEI efforts and most uh, efforts like that are, are given up after two years. Um, you know, that it's, it's not, it's not in vogue at that point anymore. So you don't want to focus on it or, you know, so people just sort of give up on that and it takes that long-term approach. Um, so, but Brian, I, the other thing that I loved about this conversation was it was a holistic approach at being a leader and being an executive director. Like it touched on so many different topics. And oddly enough, I loved early on when he started talking about the planetarium, um, just about leading a planetarium where it's like, it's like arts adjacent. I mean, there are some definitely like arts components there, but he sort of summarizes what I always try to explain, like what it being an executive director is really efficiently is that a lot of my job and a lot of our jobs is listening to the people around you, like trusting that you've got a great team that knows what they're doing and empowering them to be able to do their job better. So listening to them when they you know, need something or when they're like, hey, this is what we need to focus on. Um, so I just I, I loved that, you know, 
that these skills are transferable, um, that like it doesn't have to just be in the arts, but it also goes to other places. And um, I just appreciated the way he summed that up so nicely. Gosh, listening through it, I was like, he has found this sweet spot between or in balancing mission and practicality. Like he has really wholeheartedly behind the mission of his institutions, but he had such wonderful pieces of like very practical advice. And I feel like he approaches his job as executive director and doing development work and curation in a very practical way. He's very matter of fact, very like, this is how you get it done, right? When he was talking about if something's not working, coming to the table with multiple solutions, not just like complaining about it, but like trying to <laughs> actually be part of the solution. Like it just, I don't know, he just really struck me. Um, the, the lead time, like planning lead time, communicating, uh, just all the things he was talking about in terms of like consistency and intentionality, relationships, recognizing your own biases when you're in conversation with people. It just, mm, I'm going to go back and listen to this conversation multiple times, Brian. I also love that point about don't just come with the problem, come with the solutions as well. And I've had leaders that I've, I've worked with within our city administration that have said that exact same thing to me. They said, you know, hey, if you're going to bring a problem, bring solutions as well. And we can discuss the solutions rather than coming and complaining to me about a problem. They're like, I want to hear the problems, but I want you to be proactive and work to figure something out or at least have a plan before you come to me. And I, that's one of my favorite pieces of advice as far as problem solving within a community is don't just sit back and, and identify problems, work on solutions as well. We also see this like across the industry, but especially in like presenting where you can be a presenter um, at a university or, you know, in a private um, organization and you can know how to run, you, you can know how to present at that organization. Amazing. You can do everything right. But if you m pick yourself up and you plant in another organization, the process might still be the same, but the actual job function can be wildly different. And so preparing for a job like this, I feel like really emphasizes a lot of the things that we've been talking about with all of our guests about like taking opportunities that come to you, remaining flexible, really trying to focus in on the mission and the strategy and then that kind of helps to make you and your skills a lot more transferable to other organizations because I do not know how to run a planetarium. And honestly, <laughs> running a summer camp is a full-time <laughs> job in a lot of places. Um, thinking about all of the things that are under his umbrella as executive director and you know, knowing you all as well now, a lot of you have the same title, but like your areas of outside or adjacent to the arts are wildly different. Josh sometimes runs an ice rink. Again, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> well, it's it's just the point about being multidimensional and having taking every opportunity to learn and then bringing those experiences. Like he said, he didn't know that teaching, right, or being in loss prevention were going to inform the work that he does now, right? So taking every one of those experiences, they are val inherently valuable and you just build on them um, from place to place to place that you go. And honestly, the ones that you don't love are also inherently valuable. It might not be a great fit or you might be like, mm, don't want to do that anymore. But you have learned something about yourself and you're going to take that experience and be able to apply it in the future, which I really I just love his perspective on that. So Mark also talked a lot about the partnerships that he's working on to build programs. And some of those are in internal partnerships working with the legal team, the finance team, and some of them are more external. And um, I feel like the example that really kind of shows like how many partnerships kind of go into getting something off the ground is when he was talking about the Traveling While Black exhibit. And knowing that there are people in his direct community that are doing research on VR and being able to look for something in programming that accompanies that is an awesome way to build relationships like internally, but then also externally working with Shippensburg and Pittsburgh so that that experience doesn't just end with them so that it can travel across an entire state is an amazing thing to come from a partnership. Yeah, Danielle, I was on a call actually with Mark a few weeks ago, and he was talking about this experience and how it's been going um, and having it in the, actually the lobby of the art center, which is a brilliant place to have it. So first of all, I want to just like recognize the long-term planning and the strategy behind this installation. So he put it in the lobby of the art center where people 
So the general public, students are coming through every single day. They're going to performances, classes, the art galleries. So in terms of strategy and getting the most traffic through possible, brilliant. Um, And then he was also telling us about how well these community partnerships have been going. So these programming, the traveling while um, programming that they're doing kind of across the valley, uh, traveling up the ladder, like things like that have been going incredibly well. Those partnerships have been really successful. And then the piece of it that I think surprised him and his staff and was great to hear about was their campus security office, their safety office came through and did a training. Uh, as a with the installation, and then they were talking about it with their colleagues in other police departments and other university safety departments, and then that prodded other departments to come through and do the training and have difficult conversations. So I don't know that that was necessarily planned, but it's like a beautiful um, result of this that now people who really actually need (laughs) courageous conversations in terms of uh, public safety and policing are are getting that direct experience. And it goes to also what he was saying about how he only gets to use the spaces for 2% of the time. So he's been so creative in finding all these spaces outside of the typical venues on his campus and off campus. Um, He alluded to some of that in our conversation, but just being his neighbor and working a lot with him, I see the incredible work he's doing. He's just so creative with that. And, and he's doing a great job with his community. In all transparency, Mark and I serve together on the Pennsylvania Presenters Board, and I, I enjoy working with him on that and seeing all the great things he's doing at Lehigh Valley University. And I'm really glad that he sat down for this conversation. All right, we'll see you next time on There's No Business Like. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Like. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Van Hoek. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? (laughs) I got it. Don't worry. It is nobusinesslife.com. Do I sound out bus I miss every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. Have you ever hosted a blood drive? (laughs) We have. Yes. And we did vaccine (laughs) clinics too. But not for funding. (laughs) 